everybody, my name is Ukmar and this is Hotla Mode. Today on Hotla Mode we are going to be talking about Anna Wintour. I know that that name strikes fear into the hearts of millions, obviously. She is like a quote from uh, Candy Pratt's Price is the high priestess of fashion. Um, even I, I, fearless person, Lukemar, um, I'm scared to talk about her also. I'm also like wondering if this is going to affect future job interviews that I might or might not ever have at Conde Nast. So we'll have to see. So as I said, I'm talking about Anna Wintour. If any of you don't know who Anna Wintour is, she is the editor-in-chief of American Vogue. She is now also the artistic director of Conde Nast. So let's just get into like Anna's history, like where she comes from and all of that kind of stuff. So she was born in London in 1949 to Charles Wintour, who was the editor of the London Evening Standard, which was like a big newspaper in London, still is quite large in London. So Anna really got into fashion very early on. There was a lot of influence from her father, not because he was a fashionista in any sense, but because he told her that she would be going into fashion. At 14, she was going to a private school in London and she started to rebel against the dress code. This is where she first found that fashion was for her, and so at 15, she actually cut her hair into her very popular bob haircut, and the rest is history. She did some training at Harrods, as maybe like a sales associate, I think, or some sort of like training in fashion, and then went on to do more college. So after finishing college, she went on to become an editorial assistant at Harper's and Queen, which was a mashup of Queen Magazine, a very popular fashion magazine, and Harper's Bazaar UK. She was working under the very legendary Min Hogg, and actually Min went on to be a massive and legendary interior designer. She wasn't really that interested in fashion, actually, and Anna Wintour kind of resented her for that. Maybe not resented, but she somehow just wasn't feeling Min and decided that she would be leaving Harper's and Queen. So Anna went on to do American Harper's Bazaar. She did Viva, she did Savvy, and she did New York magazines. All of those magazines were from a bunch of different publishers. She was kind of jumping around in the 70s. She didn't really know what she wanted, but she kind of decided what her target market was. Women that were earning their own money and women that were actually spending their own money. And she decided that very early on that that was who she wanted to cater to as an editor. So after all that kind of jumping about in the 70s in New York, she decides to go back to London. She takes two or three years off, actually, just to kind of get her bearings back in London. But she decides that she is going to go for the creative directorship at British Vogue. And so the interesting thing about Anna was she fought for her salary and it was actually double what she was originally supposed to be paid. And so while she's at British Vogue, she kind of becomes friends with this girl named Grace Connington. She's just a young editor kind of working on all these things. She was a model back in the day, so they kind of become pals. Not really, not too much, but like they know each other. So at this time, she is given the ability to hire a personal assistant, and so this is when the rumors of Anna Wintour being, you know, a really tough boss kind of begin to form. This is really the infancy of that, and apparently a couple of assistants actually left her because of her high standards. So she's at British Vogue for a little bit, and then the legendary editor Beatrix Miller leaves. She assumes editor-in-chief of British Vogue. She totally like changes around British Vogue. She gets rid of a lot of staffers and starts to kind of make it very strict. British Vogue, from stories that I've heard, was really not strict at all. One time, I think Calvin Klein was trying to put ads into the magazine at British Vogue, and he said, I need to put them in right now, otherwise I'm not doing it. And the head of advertising was like, well, I'm going to lunch, so he's gonna have to wait. Grace Connington, way back in the day, was like, yo, you have to, like, st you have to do this. Like, we're gonna lose these pages. So it was very lax, and Anna really reined it all in, was very, very strict about how British Vogue was going to be. So after two or three years at British Vogue, she then goes on to do House and Garden, which was a failing um, lifestyle magazine, and they thought that Anna would be able to turn it around. But plot twist, Anna actually did such a bad job, but it was kind of a way for her to just have a bit of mulling point in New York and still being at Condé Nast. She actually helped the magazine fail even harder by replacing 
the title of it to H and G. The subscribers just thought it was like a totally different magazine, so like they just kind of started to unsubscribe because they're like, this isn't what we wanted. So House and Garden actually was doing terrible under Anna. But finally, Grace Mirabella, who was the editor in chief of American Vogue, was kind of ousted by Conde Nast. Anna finally got to take the hem of American Vogue. The thing is, Grace Mirabella was taken out of Vogue because it had become very boring. I think a lot of people understood that, and it was starting to get called out as boring. And so they needed somebody that was going to go in run a tight shift and get some really good ideas in there. And Anna was, in reality, the perfect person to do it. So she became the editor-in-chief of American Vogue in 1988. One of the first photo shoots that Anna ever oversaw at American Vogue was shot by Peter Lindbergh, and it was styled by Carlene de Dudizil. Sorry, totally butchered that, can't change it, I, I apologize. But it was actually kind of Carlene's craziness that really drew her to Anna. And Anna actually decided that one of those pictures that wasn't supposed to be a cover shoot was going to be the cover of the magazine. And what had happened was there was a $10,000 Christian Lacroix sweater with like embroidered crosses, I'll put it here. Um, it was put actually with a pair of jeans and the model's like hair was in her face and like it was just not like what a normal cover photo looked like. But Anna decided that was what was going to be put on the cover. So they sent it out for print, and the publishers called and were like, I think you made a mistake, like, this is, this is, why would you do this? And Anna was like, no, that's the photo. And so it was actually the first cover shoot. It was widely successful because American women were wearing really expensive pieces with really kind of cheap, less expensive pieces. It was how Americans styled their wardrobe, and Anna understood that. Anna had a lot of controversial things. She put a the first black model on a September cover for American Vogue. She did a lot of things that were controversial and she pushed the boundaries. So we end the 90s with Anna being the queen of the world. And then in 2003, actually there was a little known book published called The Devil Wears Prada. And it was kind of getting like a little bit interesting because the book was centered around a girl who was an assistant to the editor-in-chief of a magazine in New York and the editor-in-chief was like really crazy and like made her do these crazy things get her like steak at like 6 o'clock in the morning and like crazy Starbucks orders and stuff like that and it was found out that the writer, Lauren Weisberger was actually one of Anna Wintour's previous assistants she went on to write this book so Anna was really thrust into the limelight here because, oh, she's this crazy boss, oh, nobody wants to work for her, oh, the fashion industry's full of crazy people that just don't understand. And so it kind of gave this really, really bad taste in the mouth for Americans, people over the world for the fashion industry. So it kind of like calmed down a little bit. But then in 2006, the book was made into a movie. And the movie went on to be an iconic movie, and one of probably the most defining movies of the fashion industry. It's full of stereotypes and totally untrue, obviously, we all know that. But it really is a defining thing for the fashion industry. So Anna really never let it get the best of her. She just decided that this was not going to affect her whatsoever. She was just going to do her job. And she was still queen of the castle in the publishing world. She was beating out Elle and Harper's Bazaar US. She was destroying them. Vogue was really at its prime there. And so in 2008, Anna had really amassed all of these Vogue magazines. Not only was there Vogue US, there was Vogue Men's, there was Vogue Living, and there was Teen Vogue. But by 2008, people were losing interest in Vogue Living and Men's Vogue, so Vogue Living was actually just totally discarded altogether. Men's Vogue became a biannual leaflet that was put in with American Vogue. And so Anna was kind of like losing her stride a little bit, it just wasn't really wasn't really where it needed to be. And then there was this really serious issue where Angelina Jolie and Jennifer Aniston got in a fight in the pages of Vogue. One of them talked about the other one and it just looked so bad because Vogue had published it. And so Vogue was just really like, really hitting, hitting it hardcore down there. And it also was really iconic solely because she was the one that made celebrities want to be on the cover of magazines. She brought celebrities into the fashion industry and kind of connected celebrity and fashion culture. She is the reason that, even still to this day, that Angelina Jolie is wearing Armani to the Met Gala. She is the reason that Rihanna is wearing Dior. She is the, she is the reason that brands and celebrities are connected. She controls everything in this industry. So after these like two little controversies, it was kind of getting very interesting and rumors were starting to fly that Anna was going to retire. And what happened was Anna actually bit everybody in the ass and was like, 
hey, I'm not going to retire because she did an interview where she was like, I'm actually really proud to be here in the industry at this point. I understand American Vogue is not really where it was, but I want to keep pushing it to be where it should be. And she's taken it in stride. She's still there. She's still Queen Bee. So an amazing Anna Wintour turnaround season, in 2009, the September issue was published. The September issue was a documentary talking and explaining and highlighting how much work went into an actual magazine and especially the September issue, which is the biggest issue of the year. And so it followed around all of Anna's team, Andre Leon Talley, Grace Coddington, Virginia Smith, Anna herself, Amish Bowles, all of these people made them superstars, especially Grace Connington, who went on to be like an icon, still is. But this was an amazing way for her to turn around the hate that Vogue was really getting. It brought Vogue back on the maps, it made it really popular again. She did an amazing job. She also started to really push the Met Gala, which is a annual party held at the Metropolitan Museum of New York. It is crazy because all the designers go, all of the celebrities go, if you're a relevant celebrity at that point, you are there. She assigned each celebrity with a designer and each designer with a celebrity and you had to deal with it because that's what Anna says. And so in 2015, a movie called The First Monday in May came out which described the Met Gala and the process of putting together a Met Gala. And the Costume Institute that the Met Gala is held in is actually named after Anna and it was actually inaugurated by Michelle Obama, the First Lady of the United States of America. So in 2013, Anna was appointed the Artistic Director of Comedy Nass, which she described as it being like Vogue, but just in a broader sense. So that is currently where we're at. Let's just talk a couple of fun facts. Anna never goes anywhere without her bob, her Chanel tweed suits, and her sunglasses. Yes, those sunglasses are massive, and yes, she doesn't care. She's gonna wear them spring, summer, fall, winter, inside and outside, day and night and especially while she's watching your collection walk down the runway of Milan. She doesn't care. Anna also has been in so many controversies. There was the fur controversy where PETA threw like paint at her. There was the fat people controversy where Andre Leontali said Anna doesn't like fat people. Guess what? Anna's still there. And just the overall controversy of like her being a bad bitch. So Anna really is this kind of low down person that really is just doing her job but was thrust into the limelight. She doesn't really care that much for all of the hullabaloo that goes on. She's just there to do her job. And so I think Anna really is a really inspirational person in the fashion industry. Also a really inspirational person just in general. She's one of the most powerful people in publishing. She is a fashion icon and she's just an icon in general. So that was great to talk about her. Please let me know who you guys want me to do next for like a fashion 101 or you know, a fashion history account. I thought Anna was fun to do. I really like doing her. Also, like, I'm so scared that I'm gonna get fired from a job that I probably will never get, but it's okay. Um, so if you guys wanna check me out on all my social media, I'll link it do down below. It's all hot about, so don't even worry, it's fine. And yeah, so thank you guys for watching and TTYL. How are you enjoying this interview? Is it over?